Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India everyone welcome to the course developmental biology today's lecture is early development in chick i'm dr priya goel working as assistant professor in deen dayal upadhyay college university of delhi this is the syllabus of developmental biology that we are following we are done with unit 1 of introduction and continuing with unit 2 that is early embryonic development in which we discussed gametogenesis we will focus on spermatogenesis oogenesis type of eggs egg membranes then we also discussed fertilization changes in gametes blocks to polyspermy various planes and patterns of cleavage types of blastula and fate maps in the last lecture we discussed the early development of frog up to gestation and in today's lecture we will take up the early development of chick up to gestation this is how we will go about in today's lecture first we will study the structure of avian egg then we will discuss why the domestic chicken embryo or the gallus gallus embryo is used as a model organism preferably for developmental studies then we'll also discuss the cleavage and formation of blastula here in chick embryo the blastula is discoblastula we'll also discuss the fate map of chick embryo the process of gestation in chick embryo wherein we'll study the role of primitive streak and various morphogenetic movements in which the cells uh, move in respect to each other during gestation and we'll also discuss in brief the molecular processes which are involved in avian gestation early development in chick as an example of avian development let us begin with the structure of an avian egg an avian egg is quite large in size the common domestic chicken egg that we see around us is also quite large around 25 mm in diameter though it is a single cell but it is quite large in size now most of the avian eggs are elliptical in shape that is they are narrower at one end and broader at the other actually the avian eggs vary a lot in their size the egg of a bee hummingbird is just half a gram in weight it ranges up to 1.5 kg in the case of ostrich egg which is considered to be the largest one now uh, most of the oocyte when it is just ready to be fertilized is covered with yolk um, now this makes the egg macrolecithal and highly telolecithal in nature while the most of the cytoplasm of the oocyte is just displaced to one side and this is known as germinal disk or the blaster disk it is this germinal disk where whole of the formation of uh, blastula and i mean the whole of the cleavages will happen the blastula will be formed and then the gastrula will be formed the embryo development will occur only in this small uh, centered cytoplasm here while the part yellow which is shown here it completely covers the ovum while it is ready to be fertilized is known as yolk now this yolk cons consists of alternate yellow and white layers which are shown here and they are arranged concentrically around a flask shaped structure known as latibra the yellow layers are thick while the white yolk layers are thin uh, the yellow color of the yolk is predominantly because of the presence of various carotenoids in them Now, just below the blaster disc, the neck of this latibra expands to be called the nucleus of pander. Yolk is essentially liquid in nature. It consists of almost fifty uh, percent water, some thirty-three percent phospholipids, eighteen percent proteins, and the rest are vitamins and carbohydrates. While the entire ovum is covered by a plasma membrane or the plasma lemma, which is made up of lipoproteins. it further has a primary envelope around it which is known as the vitelline membrane 
there are no secondary membranes in the chick egg now there are certain tertiary envelopes which are laid outside the vitelline membrane these tertiary envelopes are laid by the ovipult as the ovum travels through it after getting fertilized and by after passing through the oviducts the egg has to be laid by the hen to the outside so while the egg has to develop uh, outside the body of the mother so it needs to have certain essential ingredients within itself which are stored in it so an important ingredient is yolk which provides most of the support and uh, nourishment to the growing embryo at this terminal disc region apart from that the whole of the egg white that we see in the egg consists of albumin the major protein of which is ovalbumin now this albumin is secreted around the fertilized ovum when the ovum is passing through the oviduct it is secreted by the glandular walls of the oviduct and this albumin is uh, secreted in layers around the ovum there are prominent opaque crusted cords of this albumin on each side of the ovum that we see here which is known as chalaza these chalaza actually act as balancers they help in keeping the developing ovum in the center of the egg albumin essentially consists of water and proteins then there are two shell membranes which are the outer membrane and the inner membrane laid outside the albuminous layers of the egg these skeletonized shell membranes they enclose an air space at the broad end of the egg outside the shell membranes is present the egg shell which is again secreted by the shell gland of the oviduct it is made up of calcium carbonate the egg shell is quite hard in nature but at the same time it is porous an egg shell consists of almost 7000 minute pores each of which is around 0.04 to 0.05 mm diameter they are filled with collagen and thus they help in regulating both water retention as well as respiration which is essential for the embryo that is growing inside the egg apart from these there are extra embryonic membranes present in the avian embryo now um, the reptiles birds and mammals are considered amniotes why they are considered amniotes because they can uh, their eggs consist of or the embryos lie within the three extra embryonic membranes namely the amnion the allantois and the chorion now the avian uh, egg is also cladoic in nature cladoic means that it has got the complete hard egg shell around itself so the first extra embryonic membrane or the amnion which is formed early in development it forms a watery sac around the embryo in which the embryo will develop this uh, amnion acts as a shock absorber for the growing embryo the second extra embryonic membrane is the allantois which is seen here near the posterior end of the embryo this allantois has the function of storing waste products thus it is important in the respiratory and excretory functions when the embryo is growing the third extra embryonic membrane is the chorion this is the chorion which is completely covering the embryo the allantois and the yolk sac is also seen to be covered by the chorion now this chorion contains a large number of blood vessels which helps in exchanging gases and nutrients between the embryo and the yolk this yolk sac is formed from the complete yolk which is present in the oocyte of the avian eggs now this uh, yolk sac has the function of nourishing the embryo as it is growing this yolk sac is formed during gastrulation why is chicken embryo or the gallus gallus embryo preferably used as a model organism to study embryology now the chicken eggs are first of all readily available they are available all round the year and the eggs are quite easy to incubate uh, they can be incubated in an incubator at around 40 degrees celsius during the embryological studies in the laboratories and thus they are quite easy to observe as well 
historically uh, the chicken embryos are the first ones which were used for developmental research um, aristotle in 4th century bc was the first one who uh, did the complete three week long uh, embryological study on the chick embryo and that was possible at that time even without any powerful microscope now the development of a chick embryo is very similar to that of the mammalian embryo with respect to their morphological complexity and the general course of embryonic development but at the same time the chicken eggs are quite easy to obtain and observe so they act as a good substitute for the mammalian embryological studies the mammalian embryo, uh, as we discussed in the last lecture also, are quite difficult to be observed because they are growing within the body of the mother, that is the body of the female. Now, chicken eggs can be easily observed simply by cutting open the egg shell at one end, which is the most common criteria to study chicken embryo by the students in the laboratories. Now, the chick egg can also be cultured uh, outside the egg shell easily uh, that is why they are also commonly used in the tissue culture experiments also the chick embryo is also able to survive the microsurgical manipulations made to it during experimental studies the key to study of this favorite uh, model organism is the establishment of a staging atlas by hamburger and hamilton in 1951 uh, who created a series of diagrams showing different developmental landmarks in the chicken embryo and these landmarks can easily be correlated with any experimental manipulations of development when are done by the current investigators now the fertilized chicken eggs can be easily maintained in humidified incubators and uh, during early stages of development the embryo tends to float on the top of the egg yolk which it is using for nutrition as the embryo grows further it may sink into or below the yolk also the regular appearance of somites which are paired structures on either side of the notochord on the dorsal side of a growing embryo which are quite prominent during the embryological uh, development of the chicken egg we'll also discuss the appearance of somites in the later slides so the regular appearance of these somites also allowed the investigators to accurately stage the embryo in the last lecture of fate maps we discussed nicole laudurin's studies on chick quail chimeric embryos where she was able to show how the neural crest cells could migrate widely throughout the embryo so this chimeric embryo of the chick in which the quail cells were grafted they were also able to withstand the pressures of uh, microsurgical manipulations so because of all these uh, good points about the chicken embryo it is quite a favorite organism for the embryological studies in a number of laboratories all across the globe fertilization in case of hen is internal it happens in the hen's oviduct after fertilization the fertilized ovum will travel through the oviduct to be laid to the outside the travel time during this uh, passage through the oviduct is around 22 hours and during this passage the albumin and shell layers are secreted around the fertilized ovum by the oviduct this diagram shows the fertilized ovum in which the formation of blastodisc is there this blastodisc is the area where majorly the whole process of embryo development has to take place it is some 2 to 3 mm in diameter so although the avian eggs are quite large in size but the whole embryological development takes place in this very small region of the blaster disc shown here this diagram shows the future dorsal side of the embryo at which the cleavage furrows have begun to be formed and they help in the formation of this blastula the lower diagrams show the micrographs of the cleavage furrows being developed which have been stained with alloidin green now this C diagram shows the formation of discoblastula. We'll discuss these in detail one by one. Now the cleavage and early development of egg starts in the ovida while the fertilized egg is passing through it. What kind of cleavage occurs in the bird's egg? It is meroblastic discoidal in nature. That is because most of the cytoplasm is just concentrated to one side of the ovum while most of the ovum is covered with yolk. 
so the discoidal meroblastic cleavage starts five hours post fertilization the first cleavage is meridional in nature the second cleavage is also meridional it occurs at right angle to the first one while the further cleavages are vertical and equatorial as we see here the first cleavage is happening the second cleavage the third and so on the numbers here actually are uh, referred to the layers of the cells that are being formed during formation of the blastula and the early cleavage furrows they extend downward from the surface of the cytoplasm however they are not able to completely separate the cells the cleavages are not able to extend into the yolk cytoplasm the yolk impedes the formation of cleavage furrow uh, through them so in effect the lower portions of these blastomeres that are being formed are in continuation with the yolk lying below them with further cleavages a discoblastula is formed in which the blastoderm is somewhat four cell okay the blastomeres are connected to each other by means of tight junctions eventually the blastoderm cells absorb fluid from the albumin and secrete it between the blastoderm and the yolk thereby they form a cavity between the blastoderm and the yolk which comes to be called the subgerminal cavity now deep cells in the center of the blastoderm begin to be shed off into the subgerminal cavity this leaves the blastoderm to be just one cell thick this one cell thick blastoderm is known as area pellucida where pellucidus literally means transparent so this area pellucida which is formed here is also quite translucent in nature because of the presence of this subgerminal cavity below it now this area pellucida or the translucent layer as you can see in the diagrams here it is bounded by another ring shaped layer which is known as area opaca which is quite darker in color as compared to pellucida this area opaca is actually a thick layer which has not shed its deeper cells and it also adheres to the yolk present below it which makes it quite dark in color now between this area pellucida which is present in the central portion translucent in nature and the area opaca which is present in the periphery of the area pellucida quite darker in color is present a thin layer of peripheral cells which is known as marginal zone this first diagram which is showing the mid sagittal section of the blastula shows the area pellucida in this anterior region and the area opaca which is present here which has got cells attached to it below so here you may note that the blastro disc consists of a central layer area pellucida translucent and the peripheral layer which is area opaca darker in color this area pellucida further consists of an upper layer known as epiblast as you see here this is the area pellucida epiblast and here is the hypoblast layer being developing so we can say the area pellucida consists of an upper epiblast and a lower hypoblast here the shift from maternal to zygotic gene expression during the development of the blastula occurs at 128 cell stage that is around the 7th or 8th division of the growing blastula this diagram shows the fate map of a chick embryo the fate maps Uh, of chicks have been prepared using vital dyes and carbon particle marking however the one prepared by using label appreciated thymidine is considered the best in terms of fate map studies this fate map shows the dorsal side of the embryo in which a indicates the anterior end and p the posterior end the dashed green lines indicate the site of ingression that is the path cells will follow as they migrate from exterior to the interior of the embryo in chick embryo all three germ layers are derived from the upper layer of the area pellucida which i told that it's the called epiblast then the lower layer of the area pellucida the hypoblast does not contribute in formation of the embryo so this fate map can be essentially considered a fate map of its epiblast only now you see here that the cells at the anterior part of the epiblast which are shown blue form the ectoderm while the cells little posterior 
which are shown red here give rise to mesoderm that is the body proper of the embryo and the yellow part forms the endoderm the posterior most part of the epiblast gives rise to the extra embryonic mesoderm which will form the lining of the yolk sac now here as we see the cells that will form the notochord occupy a central dorsal position in the epiblast the precursors of neural system that is the neural ectoderm lies immediately anterior to it and which is further followed by epidermal ectoderm which will form the epidermis of the skin on the outermost periphery at the anterior most end now posterior to notochord in the median plane of the embryo lies the presumptive endoderm which is shown yellow here the part of the endoderm which is closer to the notochord it forms the embryo proper and gives rise to the gut region of the embryo however later when the primitive streak that is shown here has fully formed in the growing chick embryo the three germ layers can be more clearly mapped now as we see the cells from the anterior end of the streak which is called hensen's node we will study the hensen's node in the subsequent slides the anterior end of this streak forms the axial mesoderm which gives rise to the notochord cells from lateral parts of the streak contribute to paraxial mesoderm which forms somites which are paired structures on both sides of the notochord further posteriorly the cells make the lateral plate mesoderm and then the extra embryonic mesoderm let us now proceed with gastrulation in chick embryo Gastrulation involves a set of coordinated cell movements which involve changes in cell shape and cell adhesion. This we discussed in the previous lecture of general gastrulation also. During gastrulation the blastomeres are rearranged to establish a basic multilayered body plan which involves conversion of monoblastic egg into a triploblastic gastrula. By triploblastic we mean the three germ layers the outer ectoderm inner endoderm and the interstitial mesoderm are laid down during gastrulation now during gastrulation the prospective endodermal and mesodermal cells are brought to the inside of the embryo while the prospective ectodermal cells spread over its outside surface gastrulation usually takes place by a combination of two or more type of formative and morphogenetic movements During gastrulation there is essentially an important role of cytoskeletal elements which drive changes in the cell shape and cell adhesion for example the microtubules will elongate to make the cells columnar during gastrulation process this diagram shows the types of gastrulation movements that occur in the embryos the first type of movement is the invagination invagination occurs when the cells from one side of the embryo start to poke inside the embryo or inside the cavity of the embryo as happens in the endoderm of sea urchin the second type of gastrulation movement in general is the involution during involution as we studied in the amphibian mesoderm the layer of cells start folding upon itself turns inward and starts growing on the inside of the layer which is remaining on the outside the third is the ingression during ingression some cells from the outer layer break off from it and move to the interior or to the blastocoel as happens in the mesoderm of sea urchin and neuroblasts of the drosophila the fourth type is the delamination delamination means when one layer divides into two out of these one of the sub part that is formed of the sub layer that is formed will continue growing the same way as the parent layer while the other will grow inside this delamination is seen during hypoblast formation in the avian embryos and also the mammals the fifth type of gastrulation movement are the epiboli epiboli is the movement which is mostly seen in ectoderm formation in sea urchin embryos tunicates amphibians and also in avian embryos that we see today then the sixth type is the intercalation which involves wedging of cells between their neighboring cells intercalation can be a lateral one or a radial one the lateral intercalation or the convergent extension involves lateral movement of the cells within the same layers of cells that is no intermingling between different layers will happen 
as the medial lateral intercalation in Xenopus. We started in the last lecture. The radial intercalation occurs perpendicular to the surface between adjacent layers of cells. It involves wedging of two different layers into one. And this often leads to epiboli, in which the surface area of the epithelium that is expanding will increase while its thickness will decrease. Radial intercalation is seen in Xenopus marginal zone cells. Now, after a brief recapitulation of the uh, gastrulation and the various type of morphogenetic movements in details, let us begin with the morphogenetic movements that happen during gastrulation in chick embryo. Now, in chick embryo, area pellucida is present in the center of the blaster disc, the translucent layer that we discussed. This area pellucida at the upper surface bears one layer known as epiblast. And as in the diagram, we can see this is the area pellucida epiblast. A local thickening of the epiblast appears at the posterior margin of the area pellucida, as we see in this diagram from the ventral region of the green blaster disc which is known as collar's sickle, shown blue here. This collar sickle can also be seen here. This is collar's sickle. This collar sickle is actually present as in the form of a thickening at the posterior margin of the area pellucida. Also, a belt-like region appears between the collar's sickle and the area opaca, which is known as PMZ or the posterior marginal zone. Now, some cells start delaminating inward from epiblast as clusters of 5 to 20 cells. The green cells shown here, which are undergoing delamination inward from the area pellucida epiblast. These delaminating cells soon form a single layer, which is called the primary hypoblast. A sheet of cells simultaneously grows anteriorly from the collar's sickle, which combines with the hypoblast islands to form the complete hypoblast layer, which is known. Now, this complete hypoblast layer is known as a secondary hypoblast or the endoblast. These diagrams show the formation of primary hypoblast cells, and when the sheet of cells, which is growing anteriorly from the collar sickle, grows anteriorly, and the primary hypoblast grows posteriorly, the two are combining to form the secondary hypoblast layer. The green cells which are increasing here are actually the primary hypoblast cells and this blue layer shown here are the secondary hypoblast cells. Now both these blue and the green layers combine to form the secondary hypoblast on the endoblast. So ultimately, a two-layered blastoderm is formed. The upper layer is called the epiblast, while the lower layer is called the hypoblast. The epiblast and hypoblast join together at the marginal zone of area opaca, and they enclose the cavity called blastocele. So epiblast has the responsibility to form the embryo proper and the three extra embryonic membranes of amnion, chorion, and elantois for the embryo, while the hypoblast forms the portions of extra embryonic membranes, that is the yolk sac, and also the yolk stalk, which connects the yolk sac with the embryo. Hypoblast also provides substratum and some chemical signals to specify the migration of epiblast during gastrulation. However, hypoblast does not contribute to the formation of embryo proper, it is only the epiblast which will form the embryo. The onset of gastrulation is marked by the appearance of primitive streak. After the egg is laid, it requires incubation at around 40 degrees Celsius. For this, the hen has to sit on the egg till it is hatched. Alternatively, the egg can be put inside an incubator and incubated at 40 degrees Celsius. Now, some 12 to 14 hour post link, there appears a thickening of cell sheet at the posterior end of area pellucida, which is known as primitive streak, as we see the mound of red cells shown on the ventral surface of the blaster disc and the dorsal surface of the blaster disc also. This primitive streak is formed by medial lateral intercalation, which involves 
migration of cells from the lateral region of the posterior epiblast towards the center. That is, the cells from lateral region of the posterior epiblast will move towards the center to form this primitive stream. This is another diagram which shows the formation of primitive streak at the posterior region of the epiblast. This is area pellucida shown here and the marginal zone which is followed by area opaca. Now this thickening will narrow and elongate anteriorly and undergo a constriction to form definitive primitive streak. This definitive primitive streak becomes a definitive region of the epiblast with mesodermal and endodermal cells migrating through it. This happens some 15 to 17 hours post laying. As you see in the ventral portion or ventral side of the embryo also, the primitive streak has started to elongate with a node at its tip. This diagram also shows the elongation of primitive streak which is taking its shape from posterior to the anterior side of the growing embryo. Furthermore, a depression called primitive groove develops all along the length of the streak. This groove has raised edges on both sides, which are known as primitive ridges or primitive folds. All the cells which have to migrate into the blastocele do so through this primitive groove region. The anterior edge of this primitive groove develops a thickening known as Henson's node or the primitive knot with a funnel-shaped depression in its center, which is known as primitive pit. So most of the cells which have to migrate into the blastocele do so through this primitive groove or the primitive pit. As the cells enter the primitive tree, they undergo an epithelial to mesenchymal transformation, with which the streak is able to elongate anteriorly that is toward the head region of the embryo. As the streak elongates, it increases its length, its width decreases concomitantly. Now this anterior elongation of the primitive streak occurs by convergent extension. If you remember convergent extension is the type of intercalation in which the cells undergo a transformation within their own layers thereby increasing the length of the layer and decreasing its width. Now this elongation of the streak during convergent extension is mediated by cell proliferation that is increase in the number of cells by their continuous division and more and more cells migrating through the streak to reach in the blastocene of the embryo. While this primitive streak is elongating below the epiblast the secondary hypoblast is also extending anteriorly. The secondary hypoblast which is extending below the epiblast actually directs the movement of the primitive streak toward the head region of the growing embryo. During its elongation, the primitive streak extends to almost 60 to 75 percent of the length of the area pellucid. Next is the formation of endoderm and mesoderm. Now the first cells to migrate to the Henson's node that is the anteriormost end of the primitive streak. They form the pharyngeal endoderm of the foregut inside the embryo and these cells migrate by ingression. If you remember ingression is a type of castrulation in which cells break down from the main layer and they undergo an ingression so as to reach the inside of the embryo. These cells may become free or they may become a part of another layer which is present in the inside of the embryo. So here the cells which migrate by ingression through the Henson's node, once they reach the embryo interior, these cells migrate anteriorly. That is they migrate toward the head region of the embryo where they displace the hypoblast cells to the sides thereby obtaining the middle of those hypoblast cells. These cells which are migrating anteriorly they become differential endoderm of the foregut of the chicken. The next cells to enter through the Henson's node also move anteriorly toward the embryo. They will come to lie between the endoderm and the epiblast to form the precordial plate mesoderm. And this precordial plate mesoderm induces the formation of the foregut. 
these cells move anterior to the Henson's node. Here in the diagram we see now these cells which have moved anterior to the Henson's node, they push the anterior midline region of the epiblast to form a sort of bulging which is known as head process. Head process as you see here is the area which underlies the cells that will form the forebrain and the midbrain of the embryo. The next cells to migrate through the Henson's node are the axial mesoderm or the corda mesodermal cells. The axial mesoderm gave rise to the midbrain at the level of Henson's node and it also gave rise to hindbrain and notochord caudal to the position of the Henson's node. Here we remember that notochord is formed once the Henson's node begins to regress, that is during the next phase of castration. The next cells to reach the blastocele are the ones which enter through the lateral sides of the primitive stream. Now once inside the blastocele, these cells spread into two layers. One of the stream or the layer moves deeper and joins the hypoblast. It gives rise to various endodermal organs of the embryo as well as most extra embryonic membranes. While the other stream spreads to form a loose layer of cells which is known as mesenchyme to lie between the endoderm and the epiblast. And this mesenchyme generates the mesodermal portions of the embryo as well as the mesoderm which lines the extra embryonic membranes. This diagram will explain the migration of endodermal and mesodermal cells completely uh, through the primitive stream. This is the stereogram of a castrulating chick embryo and above each region of the stereogram are present the micrographs showing the tracks of GFP labeled cells at that position in the primitive stream. Here we see that uh, this diagram shows the relationship of the primitive stream, the migrating cells, the hypoblast, and the epiblast of the blastoderm in relation to each other. The lower layer, as we see here, becomes a mosaic of these green colored hypoblast cells and the yellow colored endoblast cells. The endoblast cells have migrated through the primitive streak and they have displaced the hypoblast cells to the sides. Now, uh, above each region, as we see, are the GFP labeled stereograms. Now, uh, cells which migrate through the Henson's node, as we see the yellow colored cells here. Now, these cells will become the precordial plate and notochord in the growing embryo. This region is the presumptive head region or the anterior most region of the embryo. The next cells, which are shown purple here and in this diagram, uh, these cells migrate through the next anterior region of the stream. They travel laterally but converge near the midline eventually and these will make notochord and somites. Cells from the middle of the stream form intermediate mesoderm and lateral plate mesoderm as shown the red line cells here and here also. Further posterior uh, cells which will be entering uh, further posterior through this primitive stream they will migrate through the primitive stream to make the extra embryonic mesoderm. In the faint map, we saw that extra embryonic mesoderm is present at the posterior most region of the epiblast. So that is not shown here. And this diagram below shows the scanning electron micrograph of the epiblast cells passing into the blastocele. Now, majorly, this region is shown in this scanning electron micrograph here. We see that the epiblast cells which start to pass into the blastocele, they also extend their epical ends to become portal cells. Portal cells we discussed during gastrulation in frog also. So there is some formation of portal cells here, but it is believed that these portal cells are not able to maintain their contact with the epiblast, rather they get ingress into the blastocele and then they join the Hypoblast. Till now, we have discussed the progression and elongation of primitive streak. As we see in this diagram, showing the dorsal view of the growing embryo. Here, the 
primitive streak has begun to be formed at the posterior marginal zone of the epiblast. Now it starts to elongate and taking its shape. Here it has formed the primitive groove, which is lined with primitive edges. And it also forms a Henson's node with a primitive pit in its center. And then there is formation of head process as some of the endodermal and mesodermal cells continue to migrate through this primitive node into the blastocele and they form uh, this head process anterior to the Henson's node. So now onwards, we'll study the second phase of gastrula, that is the regression of the primitive streak back to the posterior side of the growing embryo. So earlier it started from the posterior end of the epiblast and migrated anteriorly. Now it will begin to regress back toward the caudal side of the growing embryo. So as gastrulation proceeds, the primitive streak starts to regress toward the caudal side of the growing embryo. And along with the regression of the primitive streak, the Henson's node also shifts posteriorly. As we see in this diagram, the Henson's node is present here. It has shifted a little posteriorly in this and both the primitive streak and the Henson node have almost reached the caudal end of the embryo, the primitive streak will eventually merge with the tail bud of the embryo. Now during the shifting of the Henson's node toward the posterior side of the embryo, it keeps on depositing certain cells which will form the notochord at the dorsal axis of the embryo and this laying of the cells which have to form notochord occurs in a head to tail manner, the same manner in which the Henson's node is regressing. So these diagrams D, E and F are the 20 to 22 hours of the embryo post link. This E is 23 to 25 hours which shows the two somite stage that is the first pair of somite is laid down here. And this F diagram shows the 27 to 28 hour stage or the four somite stage. Now in these diagrams the notochord has been formed in the center or in the median dorsal side of the embryo. The somites also form in pairs on either side of the notochord as it is being laid down with the regression of the Henson's node. Before this, you need to know what are somites. Somites are actually the segmental blocks of mesoderm which are formed from paraxial mesoderm and they are laid adjacent to the notochord on each of the sides. Uh, notochord, if you remember, is formed from the axial mesoderm. These somites are clearly visible in the invertebrates body, such as those of earthworms, but they are also present in the embryonic stages of certain vertebrates. These somites form the axial skeleton of the vertebrate body in the adults. Now this E diagram is the 23 to 24 hour stage or the first pair of somite is laid down here. As we see in this diagram, this is the first pair of somite or the two somites formed on either side of the growing notochord. There is an addition of one pair per hour of the growing embryo. Uh, so that at 27 to 28 hour stage of the embryo, there are four pair of somites formed. So the 27 to 28 hour stage is known as the four somite stage of the chick embryo. As we can see the four pairs in the F diagram here. So after all the presumptive endodermal and mesodermal cells have entered the embryo, the epiblast is left with only presumptive ectodermal cells. And the ectodermal cells start epiboli. Epiboli is the type of gastrulation movement in which the outer ectodermal cells expand by cell division and cell flattening so as to surround the whole of the embryo. And it takes almost four days to complete this com process of epiboli and enclosure of the yolk. During all this epiboli, the marginal cells of the area of Eka attach firmly to the vitiline envelope of the ovum. The filopodia of area opaca cells binds to the phytonectin of the vitiline envelope, and this binding helps in pulling the ectodermal cells around the yolk. Interesting to note here is uh, 
that while cells of the posterior portions of the embryo are still part of a regressing primitive streak and they are still trying to enter inside the embryo, the cells which were present at the anterior end of the embryo or which have already entered through the primitive streak and are now inside the embryo, they have already started to form organs of the chick embryo. So we can see as the primitive streak is regressing, the formation of nervous system has already started to begin. So for the next several days, the anterior end of the embryo will be at a more advanced stage in its development as compared to the posterior end of the embryo. By the end of gestulation, that is around 28 hours post fertilization, the primitive streak has regressed and gets incorporated into tail bud of the avian embryo. The ectoderm surrounds the embryo on the complete outside, that is on the surface around the yolk and around the embryo. The endoderm replaces the hypoblast in the interior of the embryo, while the mesoderm positions itself between these two regions of ectoderm and embryo. This diagram shows the chick gastrulation post fertilization. The first diagram is a 24 hour stage, which is showing the primitive streak at its full extension. The head process, uh, which is present at the anterior notochordal region, can be seen extending from the Henson's node. The B diagram is the two somite stage, it is the 25 hour stage of the chick embryo. Here the pharyngeal endoderm is seen at the anterior most end while the anterior notochord pushes up the head process beneath it. The primitive streak is seen regressing here. The third diagram shows the four somite stage which is around 27 hours of the chick embryo development. Here also the somites are being formed and we can even count the four pairs of somites being formed on either side of the notochord while the primitive streak is regressing. The D diagram shows the primitive streak has regressed to the caudal portion of the embryo and this is the 28 hour stage of the chick embryo post fertilization. This graph shows the regression of the primitive streak while it is leaving the notochord in its place. This is the anterior end and this is the posterior end of the epiblast. Now various points of the streak which are represented by letters here were followed after it achieved its maximum length. The x-axis indicates the time or the hours after achieving maximum length and the y-axis represents the length of the notochord. The reference line here is about 18 hours of incubation. So here we see this is the graph which is showing the regression of the primitive streak. The primitive streak is decreasing, uh, decreasing in its length as we move from the first to the fifth diagram here. And the length of the notochord is increasing concomitantly with the decrease in the length of the primitive streak. All during the chick embryo gastrulation, we have been studying primitive streak. The primitive streak formed, the primitive streak elongated and ultimately it regressed during the formation of chick embryo. So what is the significance of this primitive streak? The primitive streak actually defines the major body axis of the avian embryo. It extends from the posterior to anterior end of the embryo. Thereby, it defines the anterior posterior axis of the embryo. The cells which are migrating through the primitive streak will enter through its dorsal side and eventually they will move to its ventral side. So this way primitive streak also defines the dorsoventral axis of the embryo. This primitive streak separates the left portion of the embryo from its right, thereby defining the left-right axis of the embryo as well. The primitive streak is considered analogous to an amphibian blastopore also. In avian embryo, there are certain structures which are formed uh, equivalent uh, to the structures which are formed in the amphibian embryo. As you can see here, the primitive streak is considered analogous to an elongated plastopore of the amphibian embryo. 
in mvb blastopore we started uh, that all the cells were entering through that blastopore to get into the interior of the embryo similarly in avian embryo we uh, have started that all the cells have migrated or the major gastrulation movements occur through the primitive streak and the henson's node so the tip of the primitive streak or the henson's node is considered equivalent to the dorsal lip of the blastopore which forms the future tail bud in both the cases the henson's uh, node has got a primitive groove posterior to it which runs all through the primitive streak and this primitive groove is bound by primitive ridges these primitive ridges are considered equivalent to the lateral lips of the amphibian embryos plastop how the primitive streak defines the anterior posterior axis of the avian embryo can easily be understood through these fate maps of the chick epiblast the upper one shows the fate map for the definitive primitive streak stage while the below one shows the fate map of the chick epiblast at the neurulation stage and in this the endoderm has already ingressed beneath the epiblast and the arrows indicate the movement uh, of the direction of convergent extension here as we see the anterior end of the primitive streak called the henson's node gave rise to the precordial mesoderm notochord and medial part of the somites while the cells which ingress through the middle of the streak gave rise to lateral part of the somites and also to the heart and kidneys while the cells which are migrating through the posterior region of the streak they make the lateral plate and the extra embryonic mesoderm once the ingression of mesodermal cells is over what remains outside of the epiblast are the ectodermal cells so the cells which are close to the primitive streak they will form the medial or the dorsal structures such as the neural plate while those epiblast cells which are lying farther from the streak will become its epidermis thus the gastrulating avian embryo exhibits a distinct anterior posterior symmetry by virtue of this primitive streak which is formed in the dorsal side of the embryo what are the various molecular processes involved in avian gestation so there are a number of genes which play important role in the formation of avian gastrula predominantly the wedge one gene plays a crucial role in the formation of primitive streak while the cordin and sonic hedgehog genes help in the formation of henson's node at the anterior end of the primitive streak agroplast growth factor fgf which is synthesized in the henson's node prepares the epiblast for development of the neural tissue so students this completes our process of avian gastrulation so let us discuss the lecture in a snapshot we discussed that the domestic chicken egg or the gallus gallus egg is macrolecithal in nature it is highly telolecithal with most of the surface covered with yolk and the cytoplasm displaced to just one end it is cladoic in nature by virtue of the egg shell present around it and it also has got certain extra embryonic membranes the amnion the chorion the eltois and yolk sac we also discussed the functions of each of these extra embryonic membranes fertilization in case of chick egg is internal it happens in the hens oviduct cleavage begins inside the hens oviduct some 4 to 5 hours after fertilization as zygote moves down the oviduct and it is during this travel or moving down the oviduct that the tertiary membranes are also laid down around the ovum the cleavage here is discoidal meroplastic in nature and the early cell divisions are not able to cut through the yolk of the egg the blastoderm has an outer area opaca and an inner translucent area pellucida with a marginal zone in between these two layers gastrulation begins in the area pellucida near the posterior marginal zone with the appearance of a primitive streak as the primitive streak extends anteriorly or towards the head region of the growing embryo 
It develops a primitive node or the Henson's node at its anterior most end. Cells which migrate through the Henson's node reach the blastocele. The first cells to migrate through the primitive streak or the Henson's node become endoderm of the foreguard, displacing the hypoblast. Then the precordal plate mesodermal cells will move in, which induce the formation of the foregreen, followed by corda mesodermal cells, which induce the formation of midbrain, henbrain, and notochord in the embryo. Meanwhile, the primitive streak begins to regress and it reaches the caudal end of the embryo where it ultimately merges at the tail bud region. The surface ectoderm will undergo an epiboly around the whole of the yolk so as to surround the complete embryo. Primitive streak determines the crucial axis of the chicken embryo, the anterior posterior axis, the dorsoventral axis as well as the left right axis. It uh, has a huge significance in the chick embryogenesis and the chick egg hatches in 21. So after discussion of the chick embryo development, we can think of some questions. What physical structure defines the axis of the chick embryo? We just discussed the name of that visible structure and also we discussed how it is able to define that axis in the chick embryo. So you can answer this question very well. Then compare and contrast the process of early development in frog and chick embryos. So you have to compare the process of early development in amphibian embryo and the avian embryo. And you have to lay down the differences and the similarities between the two. Next, can the in early ingressing blastodermal cells be regarded as bottle cells of the chick embryo? In between, when um, a scanning electron micrograph of the ingressing cells was shown, uh, it was discussed that the ingressing cells try to form the shape of a bottle cell, but eventually they lose their contact with the blastoderm and they come to lie in the interior. So can those cells be regarded as bottle cells of the chick embryo? You have to tell your answer here. The collective efforts of various types of morphogenetic movements is responsible for successful generation of an embryo. You have to comment on this statement. So whether gastrulation involves a single type of movement of the cells or it requires uh, many type of gastrulation movement and the collective effort of all those type of movements help in successful generation of an embryo, you need to comment on this statement. These are the books which have been referred for the preparation of this lecture. I hope you enjoyed learning with me. Thank you.